In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this great day, Lord, and we thank you for Jesus' words here of challenge to us and to Peter. We just ask, Lord Jesus, that, that we do not become obstacles of you, that we might not be stumbling blocks, that we might truly learn to praise you in every aspect of our lives, that we might give our hearts and our souls to you. Open up our lives, our hearts, and our ears to hear what it is you wish us to hear in my voice to proclaim your praise. We ask this through Christ our Lord. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. One of the criticisms that we as Catholics are, uh, are, are criticized about by non-Catholic Christians is that we don't, we don't know the Bible. We don't know the sacred scriptures. And I often tell people that we know the scriptures a lot better than we think we do. We don't know verse and, and text, and, and by and large, we don't need to. We don't need to know the, the exact verses and the exact text or where things are at. We know the story and be confident in that if we're ever challenged or criticized. But one hesitancy that we have as, as, as Catholics living in the world today or as 21st century Catholics, is that we, we oftentimes think uh, that, the, that the sacred scriptures, the Bible, that the sacred scriptures aren't meant for us, <clears throat> that, this, the, that the stories that we hear, that they're just something, the New Testament, that some, it's just something that was written 2,000 years ago, the Old Testament 6, 8, 10,000 years ago, and it has no pertinent value, no pertinent meaning in my, uh, in my life today, that they're just pithy statements, they're just, uh, they're, 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 they're just there, There's, they're just part of the, you know, a part of our, our tradition, they're just part of something to help me be a better person. <clears throat> St. Paul says that the Word of God is living and true, and that it cuts deeper than any two-edged sword. It's written for us today, and it's written for us now. It's pertinent, it's, it's for us today and for us now. It's relevant for us today and for us now. It's alive, it's breathing, it's true. It's the word of God. And the story that we just heard of Jesus with Peter on the mountain is about us. It's about you. It's not just about a relationship between Peter and Jesus, not something that's just out there, outlandish. It's a story that kind of tells something it's for you, and so let's dive into it and just to come to understand what Jesus is saying to us in this story. <clears throat> so Jesus calls Peter Satan. <laughs> that was a big setup for, for that, wasn't it? <laughs> Jesus calls Peter Satan. And it's crazy to think, because if we're paying attention again to the sacred scriptures, we know what we heard just last week <clears throat> and the verse literally just before this. Just before this, we heard where Jesus, last, in last week's gospel, we heard where Jesus reveals to Peter that you are the rock. Peter confesses his faith, that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus tells him that I will build my church upon you, not upon Peter's faith, but upon Peter, upon him, the rock. And so he's going to build the church there. And throughout the Old Testament, we hear the word Satan used a lot. And so now we are here. We're here in the New Testament. So in the, in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, the, the word is Satan. And it's a Hebrew word that's used, and it means adversary. It means opponent. It means stumbling block. It means obstacle, as Jesus says. And so a Satan. And so Hebrew soon, would, they, would, they would put a, a, a definitive or a definitive article in front of it, ha, Satan, which is to mean the Satan, which is the primary adv adversary, the primary opponent, the primary stumbling block to God, the devil. So we hear about ha, Satan, in, in the book of Job. We know how Job faces off with the devil. We hear about that in, in Zechariah as well, the adversary of God, the celestial opponent, the devil, that's Hasatan. And so Jesus here 
is not calling St. Peter the devil. He's not saying you are the Satan. He's not saying you are the devil, but rather he's saying you are an, an adversary to me. You are an opponent. You are a stumbling block to me. But what is St. Peter opposing? What is he opposing here? What is he being an adversary for? The cross. He doesn't want Jesus to go to the cross. And we often cling just to Jesus' response and not the reasoning for his words. He calls Peter Satan. Oh my gosh, how could he do that? But we miss the whole point of why Jesus is telling his apostles, he's saying to them, I must go and be crucified. The Son of Man must go, be handed over, be beaten, be tortured, and be crucified. And so Peter has just been crowned the prince of the apostles, the rock. <clears throat> he's bold, he's presumptuous. If we know Peter, we know how he is. Lord, let me come out on the water. I want to walk to you. It's Peter who says, I will always defend you, and then leaves and isn't there at the foot of the cross. But, but he's also speaking on behalf of the other 11. He's, been, he's the one that's in charge. They don't want their Messiah to suffer. This isn't how the Messiah was supposed to come in. And so Peter is speaking on their behalf. We will never have a suffering Messiah. Lord forbid. We cannot have that. They want a Messiah that's free from scandal, free from pain, free from the cross. Because in the Jewish world, the cross was for pagans. It was for the worst of the worst. And Jesus is saying this is what's going to happen. So Peter becomes an obstacle, a stumbling block, an opponent to the cross. And so the rock, Peter, immediately becomes a stumbling rock, doesn't he? Satan, that's what the word means. The rock becomes a stumbling rock. So Peter, in a way, <clears throat> he tempts Jesus from the cross. He's trying to tempt him away because Jesus knows his mission. He knows where he has to go, and Jerusalem is in his sights. He's headed there, and Peter is trying to pull him away. Where else is Jesus tempted at? He's tempted in the desert by the ha, Satan, the devil, the real devil. He's tempted there in the desert where, where the devil tempts him with power and riches and fortune and fame and food. Just bow down and worship me, and I will give you all of this right? And Jesus, Jesus' words in, the, in, in, that, in that scene, they mimic, the whole scene mimics that in the temptation of the desert, mimics and echoes here this temptation of St. Peter on the mountain. And so Jesus there, he says, be gone, Satan, depart from me. Ha, Satan, the adversary, be gone. And so what what was, what was it that the devil was trying to tempt Jesus from, trying to keep him from? The cross. Because the devil knows that he's destroyed and defeated by this one, the Holy One of God. The cross. Jesus knows what he has to do, why it is that he has come to suffer for you, to suffer for me. The cross is the demonstration of God's love. It's our everything. The cross is where God pays the price for man's sin, for your sin and mine. The cross is the means in which the grace of God is given to us. Without the cross, there is no love. Without the cross, no greater love, no forgiveness. Without the cross, there is no healing. There is no connection to God. Without the cross, there is no heaven for you and for me. Without the cross, there is no hope. This is the temptation in the desert. This is the temptation of Peter. He's trying to pull Jesus from the cross in his own human ego. I want a Savior. I want the Messiah as I want him. How often do we do that ourselves? I want God to fit in my box and how I want to live my life. 
Get behind me, you stumbling block, Jesus says. Get behind me. Stop being an adversary to me. I have to get Stephen to jail. I have to just get Stephen out of jail. I have to release him from, from the prison. I have to get him to heaven. I have to get Allison. I have to get Beth. I have to get Scott. I have to get Mary and Carolyn. I have to get them to heaven to break them free from the prison bars of jail, the prison bars of death, and to raise them to new life. Peter is acting in this moment as an adversary to God's plan. And when you and I think according to the world, when we think as man does and not as God does, as Jesus says, we are acting as adversaries. We're acting as stumbling blocks. Then we too are stumbling blocks, opponents to God. Think of, as I was praying with her, I was just trying to think of an analogy. And what I was thinking of was a barbecue I had for a bunch of seminarians just this last week, and I marinated chicken with them. <laughs> And I serve them chicken breasts. You know, think of marinating chicken. And so chicken, a chicken breast marinating for a day and we enjoyed a great barbecue. If all we do is marinate our lives in the soul, in our, in our souls, in the mind of the world, in the, in the mind and the thinking of the things of this world, then we're not thinking as God does. We have to marinate ourselves, marinate our hearts, marinate our souls in the things of God to think as he does, to put on his heart, to put on his ideas of the way we ought to live. And in doing so, we, don't, we are not adversaries of God. We are friends of God. But notice the play on words here also. Jesus says to Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan. But then he also says to his apostles, you must take up your cross and follow me. There's a play on words there. In, in, in both instances, Jesus is at the lead. Even if we choose to live among the world, he is still the leader. He is still the king. He is still God, and we will face our consequences at the end of our lives. But he says to us as his friends, do not act according to the world. Act as I am, as I am asking you to take on the voice of God, take on the voice of the church and follow me. But it gets even better than that. It gets better for Peter. We may think that Jesus calls him out, tells him, calls him Satan, and it just kind of gets awkward in their friendship, right? Uh, you know, like, well, I got to spend the rest of the next two years with this guy. What's, it, what's this going to be like? But it gets better immediately following this, and I mean immediately following this, Jesus says to Peter, you can almost imagine it, he takes Peter, James, and John, and he takes them up on the mountain to be transfigured. It's almost like he says, Peter, I know your human heart. I know what you want, but this is what God wants. This is what I want as your Savior am going to do for you. And he reveals his glory. And Peter is corrected. He follows and he grows in faith, hope, and charity. The same too for us. When we stray from the voice of God and his church, when we repent, we follow again. And in doing so, we grow in union with God. That's the promise. And that's God's message to us today, that, the, that this story is for us. Let's not be adversaries of the Lord, but let's take on his heart, his mind, and live according to his plan for us, knowing that, we will that he's asking us to take up our crosses and to follow him. Amen.